the road to Stansfield View Hospital, a journey I took many times in the early 1990s as a student nurse on placement there. 30 years since its closure, it's with mixed feelings I'm remaking the journey. From the main road up the steep valley side, you get an impression of leaving civilization behind, the town of Todmorden far below. For many people who lived at Stansfield View, the journey marked their leaving behind their homes, families, the things that were familiar to them to live a life segregated from their local community, kept apart from day-to-day -day life, removed from the things most of us hold dear. Although Stansfield View is no longer here, it was demolished after its closure in 1993, what does remain is a sense of being in a remote place. The landscape is sometimes described as bleak and isolated, but it's also very beautiful and full of drama. Our landscape shapes our identity. Just as we put our imprint on our surroundings, equally they influence who we are. They become part of us. This is an area I love. I often walk here. It's a place that's imbued with meaning. Some people crave to be by the sea. Perhaps it's a sense of escape, of adventure, the possibility of journeys, the chance to leave things behind. But here you're quite literally moored surrounded by the hills and moorland of Calderdale, a sea of earth, wide expanses, brooding clouds casting shadows over Pennine Hills, surrounded by the elements. Of course, I visit it by choice and can then return to my home and family, the people and things I love. This was not so for many of the people who lived at Stansfield View. This landscape has another history. It tells us the story of the many people with learning disabilities who lived on this remote moorland hillside, of those who worked there, of its connection to the nearby towns and villages, both geographically, psychologically and emotionally. A deeply rooted and enduring connection to the hearts and minds of generations of people. It also tells the story of how we view people with learning disabilities, of our values and attitudes, how these have changed over time, and in doing so, tells us about who we are and where we came from. It's a difficult history, for some a secret one, one that many people would rather forget. But it's important that this story is told and not forgotten. We should act as custodians of this era, acknowledge and value what people with learning disabilities have been through in the past, and how this can inform the present and shape the future. It's the purpose of this film to tell some of that story through first-hand accounts from the people who lived and worked there. Any history of a place is really the story of its people. It's people that breathe life into places where we live and come together. The story of Stansfield View is the story of people with learning disabilities and how our values and attitudes towards them have changed over time. Like many other long-stay hospitals, Stansfield View was originally a workhouse, accommodating around 300 people. In 1948, the institution became Stansfield View Hospital, providing care for the mentally handicapped, as people with learning disabilities were known at that time. But this was not a hospital where people were admitted, treated, recovered and then discharged. This was a place where people with learning disabilities were taken, often in childhood, and remained for the rest of their days. Stansfield view represents the idea that people with learning disabilities should be segregated from the general population, kept apart and hidden away. In the 45 years from its origin to its closure in 1993, significant progress in how we view human rights, individual freedom and civil liberties were shaped by changes in laws, public opinion and in response to a growing recognition that people with learning disabilities should have the same inherent rights, opportunities and values as everyone else. I spoke to Jonathan Beebe, Royal College of Nursing professional lead in learning disability nursing, about the history of long-stay hospitals and how our perceptions towards people with learning disabilities have changed over time. 
I'm Jonathan Beebe. I'm the professional lead for learning disability nursing at the Royal College of Nursing. So, um, well, it was towards the end of the 19th century when uh, we started having the institutions appear. It was um, it was kind of the answer to everything, really. So, uh, if we had a social problem, let's build an institution for it and, and put it there. So, there was epilepsy Connollys. There was Connollys for single mums. Um, but yeah, there was institutes for um, people with learning disabilities, and. Um, it was part of the eugenics movement originally, and it was um, looking at how we, um, I suppose the, the fear in the, with the eugenics movement was, um, would these feeble-minded, as they were called at the time, feeble-minded people be breeding with each other and create more feeble-minded people. So they created the institutions and they were there largely behind closed doors, out of sight, out of mind, um, and, and dealt with by the attendants in there. Um, the time you're talking about 1948, that would have been just after the um, NHS mm -hmm. was, was established. Um, so it's moving um, moving the care of people with learning disabilities into NHS care would have been at that time. Um, so yes, yeah, so it would have been formalising, it would have been... a. Um, about 30 years after the nurses register had been established and nursing was becoming professionalised. Um, learning disability nursing was a field of nursing. It would have been the, the um, field of uh, mental subnormality uh, at the time. Um, and, and just so that people were still cared for in those large institutions, uh, although it was becoming possibly a bit more professionalised. Just for people that don't know, just yep. explain a bit more about what the eugenics movement was. Yeah, so eugenics is um, when you attempt to improve society through selective breeding, effectively. Um, so um, we probably know m most commonly about the eugenics movement from World War Two and Hitler's use of, of eugenics in, in creating the, the super German race that he was trying to create at the time. Um, for for the learning disabilities, it was trying to reduce the amount of learning disabilities in society by colonising and controlling them. If you look back before the institutions, um, you can see in history information about uh, how people with learning disabilities were had valued roles in society and you can you can see people with learning disabilities being parts of their communities. With the eugenics movement and locking people away, I think came a notion that um, people need to be cared for. Um, a lot of people with learning disabilities do have very complex needs and, and they're very dependent on other people. Around the, the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, we were seeing a lot of industrialisation and um, people looking for a productive Britain, I guess. Um, and I guess people with learning disabilities would have been seen as less likely to contribute and more of a burden, I guess, on people's time and on people's resources to earn and to, to develop and create. We had the J report in 1974, and, and that said it might be 1979 actually. That was the, the first social policy that started to say why are people with learning disabilities in hospital? Um, it questioned the role of learning disability nurses, uh, and it looked at you know what why are these people cared for in this institutional setting? Why aren't they in our, in our neighbours? Um, Around the same sort of time, we had a movement called the Normalisation Movement. Um, so that was in the 80s. It was largely led by a man called Wolf Wolfensberger in Austria. Um, and a lot of um, Wolf Wolfensberger's work was about if we give people socially valued roles, then there will be socially valued people. Today, we, we've moved to a, a position where people are rightly expected to have the same rights as everybody else. Uh, and that largely came from the Community Care Act. We would kind of see people with learning disabilities would a lot of the time hidden away, so we wouldn't see them. Um, or we would see maybe the odd person in that community who we would see as that being that little bit strange or odd person, but not really understand who they are to having more of a dialogue about what does it mean to have a, a learning disability and to, to be living with that in the community. And very sadly, um, scandal has um, plagued the, the lives of people with learning disabilities and it's driven a lot of policy change. So yeah, largely, I think um, the, the first big scandal that was uncovered, to, to my knowledge, was the Eloy Hospital scandal, uh, which was in the 80s, which was uncovered by the News of the World. Uh, and that uncovered people uh, being um, horrifically abused. Um, I think a little bit later from that, there was um, a documentary series called Silent Minority, which you can still watch on YouTube. 
And, um, and that was a fascinating insight to life behind these closed doors that you know we, we'd, we'd never seen before. Um, and if you look at the care people were receiving then, you will see people lining up in a queue to get in the same bath water. Um, you'll see people handed clothes from a shared clothes bag. Um, but you will also see um, very caring responses from the, the staff that were there. And, and I think that's something we've got to remember from history. I think we, we will often look back and think, how barbaric people were, were treated then but it's how that's how culture was at the time to treat people and i think that regardless that most of the, the care was treated with with care respect and dignity so it's remembering at the time that society had many different views and values so um being a single mum would have been uh frowned upon ha having a child outside of uh, wedlock would have been uh, frowned upon having a child with a learning disabilities again would have probably been seen as um, something that you don't keep the terminology that would have been used at the time would have been feeble-minded mentally subnormal men mentally handicapped um, I suppose it would have been looking at um, where this is probably where the Royal Men Cap Society would have come about as well because that would have been a group of parents um, that, that got together and, and started um, to say you know that they, they wanted to maintain looking after their loved ones and, and keeping them in their homes. And all of the terms that we've used for learning disability in the past have been medical terms so they, they've been respectful medical labels that have been used What's changed is society and society's attitudes and how we treat people. Um, and I think, so our, our values as a society have changed, but also it's how words get used, um, how words get misused, I should say, that leads to them becoming event offensive. There's, there's a balance, I think, of, of moving on from what we now find offensive um, to not losing the history as well. It's you, you, you sort of you're picturing a really large room with a row of beds in it uh, and not a lot of personal space between those beds. Um, so it would, you would have had no personal space, you would have had no personal belongings, no personal toiletries. Um, quite, quite often um, the attendants would be walking down picking clothes out of a bag going, that looks like it fits you, that looks like it fits you. Um, yeah, you could be queuing up to have a bath um, and sharing the same bath water as, as your, your predecessors. Um, there would be meaningful occupation to be doing uh, on, on the site, but it would have been large ratios of um, people being supported to the attendants there. So uh, if you weren't necessarily taking part in those activities, you could be wandering aimlessly, sorry, in the um, corridors waiting for things to happen. It would have been a, a completely different world that you're growing up in and, and you know, we're, we're, deeply, we're all deeply affected by the environments that we're surrounded in. Um, and I suppose what we know now is that sometimes those hospital environments can perpetuate problems uh, or create them even. We, we, we often question why we put groups of people with challenging behaviour all in the same setting. Because if you're sat next to someone who's distressed and making noises and acting distressed, you're going to feel anxiety and you're going to feel distressed yourself. Um, so it's going to lead to more complex behaviours in yourself. So being in the institution kind of creates some of the need to stay there. It then makes it very difficult for people to be discharged and to move out and to live in, in an ordinary life. My name is David Martin. I was born on the 10th of June 1942 at Valley Street in Eastwood. I moved to Sunsville View approximately 1950 and left there in 1964. My mum and dad worked at Sunsville View. My mum was head cook. My dad was a stoker for the um, Lancashire boiler that they had there and a general handyman as well. Stansfield View had, I think, the last pair of working Shire horses in West Yorkshire. And I, I was allowed to work the two of them, but they knew what they were doing better than I knew what I was doing. And then they had a cart shed, one cart shed, and it still had all the old carts in there, the stables, 
the driver of what we used to call the jeep, it was the bus that went down to pick up the stuff for both Field and myself who are you. And they had three drivers from Springside up Shorewood Road. Right, so that was to bring people what, from the main road up to the yeah, hospital? Yes, because that people that wouldn't them. come work at South Wilbur because of the war. Yes. I never really went into the inner sanctums of the wards. Okay. All the bits round and about, yes. Did people that lived in the hospital, were they out in the grounds? Did you see people? Oh yeah, out? yeah, I played about with a lot of them. Did you? Yeah. Well, when we were there, we they had men and, men and women, obviously. Mm -hmm. But they started, and they had boys. And they started taking girls. Um, so they were all playing out there. They were segregated loosely. Okay. Like the female ones were up at the, you know, the top end of the hospital grounds and the male were generally down at the bottom end. But I mentioned this Jack Wright. Um, he was, as far as I know, he was the first to go out into the community. He, he was, he was okay with Jack, big lad, red hair, and he, he lived in Tomlin, he went down to Tomlin, I, I don't know what it is, he always had a house down there, where I don't think it was any kind of sheltered accommodation, he just went to put down, quite a lot of people knew him, he used to go for a, a drink, yeah. he just acted like a normal person, right. but that was his background, he okay. was uh, from Stantwell Um And he was just accepted, do you think, in the town and... Yeah. 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 This care in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, more patients were identified as being okay to do it, but it wasn't a gated community, but it had invisible gates. Right. That's where they were, and that's where they were happy. Okay. I know a lot of the um, the younger ones, when the parents came to take them home for a weekend, they did not want to go. Did they? Yeah, mum and dad both did. Yeah. It was a good place to work. Um, yeah, uh, well, they worked there until the day they retired. Right. Uh, and then with no thought to do anything else because it was a, quite a satisfying job. In the 60s, they built a terrace of maybe six or eight houses, um, which were for stuff accommodation. So this is where you probably, you, the uh, female staff workers, they would have lived okay. in that. Right. Eventually, uh, that became a stopping off point for any patients that were going to maybe go into the community. Oh, okay. to go right. and live in there. And what, to get used gain to independent skills yes, and things? Yes. yes, to understand what it was like right. to be in a house and cook your own food or whatever it might be. I just had one experience that scared me. And my dad beat the stoke, he's got the Lancashire boiler and they were coal fired. And we just had uh, bunkers full of coal down there. And they used to get the um, the patients, one of their tasks was to fill the wheelbarrows, ring them in, and fill the bunker inside where the boiler was so my dad could just shove it straight in. And this guy was doing it and he was always an odd one. And I was just kind of stood there watching, I wasn't doing anything. And then he just threw a complete wobbler and he threw this um, shovel at me and it was like a helicopter blade coming. And I ran and it missed me, but it scared me. And that's the only time I can think that there was any kind of aggression shown towards me. But yeah, a lot difficulty in speaking, mm -hmm. um, repetitive behaviour, you know, they sit down and just rock all day long. Right. It was a big, big building. In hindsight now, I think it could have been worth retaining because of what it was, but it would have been a horrendous cost. Mm. I enjoyed living there. I really did. You can probably tell where I'm talking about it. It was just, it had a lot of history and feeling about it. And lovely people, both staff and patients. It was quite a community. I don't know, you know, you you were there a bit, but it it always seemed fairly harmonious. You could see the way that the staff attitude was, and you could see the way that the patients uh, liked what was happening.
Hello, my name is Tony Zimnock and I worked at Stansfield View and Field in from 1969 to 1971. I was living in Halifax with my parents and it was my first job. Uh, I left school in 1969, 68, 69, and that was actually the first job I had. So I travelled from uh, Halifax to Todmorden uh, on my bike, a motorbike. Um, I was too young to go into nursing as such, so I started as a cadet nurse, which involved Monday to Friday during the day. And then when I turned 18, I, uh, I started as a student nurse. Oh, a nursing assistant and then a student nurse. It very, there was a lot of variety. For example, I worked, it was before, um, it had its own school then, so I, I'd work in the school occasionally, which was great, you know. Um, it varied, but, but as I say, some of the wards were, some of the wards were more difficult than others, or, or more challenging. And, but some of the people were great. I mean, I, I had a. In fact, it's strange because afterwards, part of it, we'd go into Chatham Street. I met some of the people. There was a woman that lived maybe two hundred yards from Stansfield View on a farm. And uh, they had a son who, fully enough, I met him in Topmodern the other day. Uh, and they were advised or put his son into the hospital, blah, 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 as it went. And they adamantly refused. So he was actually living at home with his parents, not half a mile from South Lodeau, which was bizarre. You know. uh, there was the school, as I say, and I'm sure there was some sort of occupational therapy. Um, but there did seem to be a lot of times when people had a lot on that, you know, idle, um, and they didn't see anything other. So there were set pieces where some of the people went to, but not all of them, you know. I can, um, you know, I can remember people who, who were patients or residents who would do nothing all day and would be virtually, there was one guy I remember who, uh, his day comprised of being woken and uh, being taken to a corner of a room and that was it for the day, you know, it was, uh, and then taken back at the end, you know. Uh, I mean, in, in, because it's history, it, it was a workhouse originally, it wasn't in a funeral hospital. Um, yeah, I mean, one, and I don't know if it was true, but one myth that was, it was taken as the truth and never found out, I never found out, but it was said at the time, this is before all the, the new roads were put in, um, that it would take a, a fire engine three hours to get there because of the circular route they'd have to take to get there. Uh, started as a cadet nurse and then for a short time, once I turned 18, nursing assistant. Um, and uh, then student nurse uh, for a short time. So, you know, I mean, in terms of the maintenance, but just the design was all wrong. You know, um, as I say, uh, in the main stance review, I, I remember the three stories. I remember somebody falling out of a plate glass window. I think I mean, they must have had a plate glass window because I remember a patient falling through and having to take it go to hospital with them. You know. He, um, but no, it wasn't practical. It wasn't obviously designed for people's mobility needs or safety needs, really. I don't makes feelings about it now. I can see that, historically, I get it. So now I can see that the medical model is a good model uh, compared with what came earlier. I do get that. But, I mean, it's far from perfect, but it has improved. I mean, just things like, I don't actually remember going out to any like shops or um, cafes or anything with people. But I, I can remember when I went, started teaching, we used to, even this is back in, uh, uh, when it would have been the late 70s, you'd still get situations where people would be refused entry. The lady called Isabel, who, um, was a uh, patient at Santa when I was there. Now, I don't know how old she was. She seemed very old to me at the time, being 19. She was probably 60, 70, 80, whatever. 
Uh, and she actually been put in Stansfield View when it was a workhouse. She'd had an illegitimate kid. The kid had been taken off her, and she and she was still there. Through all the changes, it must have gone from workhouse to fever hospital to uh, mental handicap hospital, whatever it's called. Uh, and she, somehow she got left behind, and she was still there. And she was she was in, totally institutionalised. It wouldn't have been fair to let her out, but she was as bright as a button. And she really, I uh, thought really, and I always remember her for that reason. You know. Talking about visitors, I always re another memory that has remained is um, Sundays. Oh no, the, 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 uh, there was a priest that used to come. They, they sort of used to have masses, or uh, so they, they, they like local religious groups would come. Uh, Sundays I always remember because that was when uh, parents would come. So it was always a big thing that everybody got the, the, the Sunday best on, literally the Sunday best, uh, for things like that. If they had visitors, not many people, not everybody had visitors, but I honestly think the expectation was that that is all there is, this is it. You know, just be thankful you're being fed and clothed. And, uh, so a, a and basic everything. level of care, would you say? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think anybody, well, all, all I can imagine if there's, I'm sure that would be the consensus with the staff, so I would imagine um, that would be the same for the people, the residents, I would think. Now, maybe things change. Things did change because not long after I left, the school moved. And I forget where they went, I think London and Dean. Right, okay. You know, so the, 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 the school was no longer in house and people travelled out. And I think that it, it was probably. Just before there was a, 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 things accelerated and things became more open and things changed, hopefully. Did people have the clothes? Um, I would imagine, well, I can't remember whether they were labelled, they'd be labelled. And this was the thing about Sunday visits or Sunday bests. Um, they were kind of kept separate. Yeah. So I think they were kind of stored somewhere you know, for big occasions. Uh, but yeah, I think most of the things were, I think. There might have been communal things because there was a laundry and, uh, you see, there were a lot of people who were, uh, some people who were, who were bored out of the trees and would sort of vocalise and bang their heads and things like that, just out of sheer boredom, I would think. Um, so it could be quite noisy. Uh, smell, well, the obvious smells, there was, there was, uh, Uh, I don't know, I mean it shows how naive I was at the time because I, I, I remember one of my first days there and uh, there was somebody had urinated and me getting in a big flap saying oh somebody's pissed on the floor or whatever uh, and everybody laughing at me because this was kind of a, a normal occurrence which is a bit crude but that's, that's the way it was. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I feel as though I'm painting a really negative picture about the place, but there was a lot of kindness from the staff and there was a lot of friendliness with patients and there were and a good rapport in a lot of cases. So it wasn't all horrible, you know, it was just everybody making the best of the bad water almost. Hello, my name's Pamela Bingham. And I'm Gail Bingham. I moved up there and I was able then to do another two years to bring me up to being registered. But I'm actually a registered nurse for the mentally subnormal, whether you want to call them residents, clients, whatever. They were actually put into four, one of four different categories. Imbeciles, idiots, feeble-minded and moral defectives and that was how people were classified then. Even in the even in nineteen eighty? Yeah, which were appalling. Occupational therapy. And we took a big chunk and put it along but at the top and got some go carts and uh, loads of bales for the for the brighter 
men. And they used to have go-kart races down there. I remember one guy actually took it, you know the hill? Yeah. Took it down there for a ride. They were then banned. So he decided it, uh, if we were going to ban him from doing that, we are going to go on a hunger, hunger strike. The doctor used to come every couple of weeks. And he said, oh, if it's on hunger strike, that's fine. Give him some uh, appetite. Stimulate. <laughs> he soon changed his mind. One of the obvious physical helping people dress and things like that, such as that. Um, but mainly it was just sort of social, making sure that they were all where they should be and, you know, people going off to different therapies, the occupational therapy and... Uh, they went to OT, didn't they, doing gardening and... Yeah. CSSD yeah. work that they did up there as well, weren't they? Oh, sorry. The, where they did all packing. Stuff. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did some some little like this little area where they did. They packed cotton wool balls. They had a block that, so they could put six in. And then they went in a bag, and then they went to the autoclave to. One of our one of our two guys um, used to take some of the more able men down to the pub Rose and Crown, and then it, in turn, yeah. obviously, you know, take, take two or three at a time. Uh, only, if, only if they were doing, uh, they were okay. And they were, there are a lot of people up there that shouldn't have been there. Mm. So should, should never have been there. But there were nowhere else for people to go. Okay. If somebody was at the hospital and they were much more able, would they have had a, a role um, within the hospital? Would they have helped? Um, or think? The only one really that, uh, that had a, a proper role uh, was one guy. He'd come to us. Because he'd, uh, he'd been elsewhere and they couldn't cope with him. He'd, he'd no relatives or anything like that. And he used to voluntarily, when the laundry men came with all the uh, clean laundry, and he'd, he'd be helping them unload the, you know, the stuff off and what have you. Uh, so eventually they decided that if we were going to do that, we were going to get paid for it. And they, they made it into a proper job. Because he was so able, they found that he, sh he shouldn't be there. So they found him a little flat that set fire to. Because he didn't want to be there. He didn't think he wanted to be back at the hospital. Yeah, and think, were it called yeah. Les? Hmm? Were it called Les? Yes, Les. It was Les. Yeah. And it was really, really cruel because of people that had lived at Stansfield View for years and years and years and years and years. And then it got shipped off to Manchester or somewhere because that's where they were born and that was their area of origin and that was really cruel about moving people about like that that didn't want to go, they were happy where they were, you know. I mean we had holidays, we took people on holiday, um, we had some quite nice holidays uh, with more able people. Um, at that time we used to take about six at a time, you know, and then it helped it. As time went by, they, they sort of cut it down and cut it down so that there were more individual holidays yeah. rather than a big group. But it, it was fun. It was fun going on holiday with them. You know. The physical building, like when you were there, did it start to deteriorate then? Or? No, not really. I, didn't, I never saw any deterioration in the, in the structure of the building, no. And it was, it was right about the food. The food was really, really good. I mean, we, had a big, uh, we had a big dining room where people went and had lunch in the dining room, but then we had, of course, two particular areas weren't able to go into the dining room because you couldn't get there, up and down the steps and what have you, the, you know, with the wheelchairs and, and all the rest of it. But yeah, the food was good. And it, was, did it, it wasn't just put in front of them. There were, you could go and choose. People could go and choose. But this um, shared school that uh, we used to hire, one day a week, one afternoon a week, so that we could take people swimming. Just us. Mm. And that was really good fun, because it, and it was nice for people to be, and it was warm because it was a children's pool, because a lot of swimming pools were freezing. And uh, yeah, that was good, it was nice. That was part of, another part of leisure that I was doing that, uh, that was nice for people, something completely different. Well, I can't like living up there. It was quite it was a nice place to be, with lovely hills and views and everything in the background and, the, and where was the staff, uh, staff 
provided house. I had to pay rent, obviously. Um, very nice house. One lady surprised a lot of people. Um, she was on she was on the log where they did the uh, mushing for the food, and uh, she'd been there a long, long time. And uh, she used to come up and sit and uh, take her out for a, a riding car and bring her back and all the rest of it. And uh, she sat this particular day, and her mum had given her a paper, a newspaper. And she sat with this newspaper this particular day, and she's saying, Oh, so, 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 so. And everybody looked at her and said, I can't believe she's reading. And she'd been there for years, and nobody knew she could read. And it was just amazing that she just suddenly done that. But all the things that she'd missed mm. by people not knowing yeah. about her. Yeah. And I suppose that assumption, isn't it, that of course yeah. that person can't read. Yeah. Yeah. Could she read? Yeah. Him and one of the ladies got friendly. But obviously, I'm going back then, you know, and nothing happening. And they used to find a way where she'd go up the back steps. And he'd go up the back steps. But he, he had, there were some of the men on that top corridor that had rooms of their own. All right. Because they progressed to the level where they could be trusted to have a room of your own and look after it. And uh, he used to, this lady used to go up there and uh, spend some time with him. But you always knew when she were in there because of the, like the old fashioned doors where you've got a door and a little bit of a window. Oh, with steel mesh. So it was steel yeah. mesh thing. And that would come up right. with a magazine. So you knew that they were in there together. And you think, why not? I would have been seven when we moved, so it were it were like moving to the wilderness for me. Because we'd lived on a big housing estate in Bradford, hadn't we? Um, yeah, so it was like moving to will proper wilderness up on moors mm. and everything. We had to get a special minibus to school because there were no proper public transport links up there or anything. Because they couldn't, they physically couldn't get mm. buses up yeah. there. Um, so you felt a bit special turning up to school on your on the private minibus. I I remember one big, really big summer fair, summer event that um, the war. And loads and loads of people came, yes, obviously people's right, yeah. friends and family, but I think the people from Harlem Park came as yeah. well, didn't they? Yeah. Um, and I remember a fire engine came up, so a fire service came up, so people could do silence oh, yeah, yeah. and things like that. That were a, a really nice day that I, I remember. There were League of Friends shops, so I remember going in there, you know, the just... It were, some, it were people's family and friends wanted to run the shop, there were yeah. volunteers who ran the shop. Um, so you just go in and buy and get a drink or some sweets or whatever in there. Um, the, the residents did have money, uh, an allowance, and they could go into the shop and buy things as well. You know, even if you took them in a wheelchair, they could go and buy a sweet or something else from there. A nice little shop. Yeah. And to play in grounds and things like that, because they were beautiful grounds, mm. weren't they? For a field and... I remember seeing people doing gardening up in OT, um, went to the cinema a few times in Ebden Bridge with people that lived there, kind of smuggled in. <laughs> um, and one, one of the things that I really remember is Michael, who lived it, and because he had it, he went on Cherry Ward, and I was just absolutely amazed. I was in awe of how clever he must be to remember all of them symbols on that board. You know, because I was so young and I thought, how on earth do you remember all of them? So this is Michael Oswald we're talking yeah. about, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you did a lot of work with Michael, didn't oh, you? Oh, gosh, yeah. I was Michael's PA for many years. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, years, years, so. yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, we used to work in university together and do lots of things, and he was, um, I mean, it's, we always think if people don't get early input, which you wouldn't have thought Michael would necessarily the work flourish, but Michael was the exception to that because yeah. he, um, he really did. And he, had, he just got so much out of life. It was unbelievable. Like, he just squeezed every ounce of like yeah. joy out of life yeah. that he possibly could. Yeah. I also remember interviewing with him as well and it, 
we won't, you can't have a number, man. Uh, that was, <laughs> we don't, no matter how, I'd always be doing the drill. Remember, we'll stick to the questions. Do not ask for the person's number. We can't do that. And don't ask for your picture taken. <laughs> first question in fire. You probably think there's an audience. I will do whatever I like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but that's one of my really early memories is going on to Cherry Ward and just being amazed at how clever this man was yeah. to remember all of them, the little symbols. So, yeah. As influenced me because I'm a lot more accepting of of people that have got differences, you know, so it probably did have, but the the differences that I could see, the impact on people that we were supporting were massive. Although there were so many gains for people, weren't there? Going to live in, you know, a much nicer, smaller house, a lot more person-centred and things like that. They lost an awful lot as well, didn't they? Because somebody, you know, if somebody wanted to go from Foxglove Ward and have a wander over onto, because there were ladies building, weren't there, in men's building. If somebody wanted to go and have a wander over and have a chat to admin staff or go and talk to somebody down there, they could, couldn't they? Yeah. But once they were, li once they were living in these small community homes, that were it. They couldn't go anywhere unless they had a staff with them. So, Barbara, tell me a little bit about the job that your dad did at Stansfield View. He used to drive the buses. Dad did a big Did you ever visit him at the hospital? Yeah, I used to wait at the bottom. Did you? And go up in the van. And oh. show, show me I wanted to do a walk. So did you get to meet people that lived at the hospital? No, I was disabled. Right. I was a Sandra Oxley. She had bars on her leg, but it took, took them off her. And she got to all the other sons to die. She went out to pull her, and Jennifer Dover pulled pull her hair all the time. Well, I, I remember Jennifer Dover. Yeah, but no, 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 no. And then just to drive horses and that's a big man. That, that's all he did. And, and did you like working there, Barbara? And buses and driving buses. Why, why were the people living at the hospital, do you know? They were all disabled and they got closed down. Yeah. And they got some out into the community. Yeah, I know at the hospital they used to have um, galas and fates and fairs. Did you ever go to any of those? The bomb fair night. Hello, uh, my name is Mark Fenley. I'm a learned disability nurse and I worked at Stansfield View Hospital from January 1983 to March 1993, 10 years in total. It ended up at the hospital and it was just deserted on a Sunday afternoon in the middle of winter. It, was, it would have been the bank holiday weekend, wasn't it, looking back. There was nobody there to greet us. We were wandering around with the patients as they were then coming up to us. It was just completely terrifying. You know, we're 18 years old and we were just dumped there, really. We went to find some to let us into our rooms, which were in another part of another hospital up the road called Fielding, and that's where we lived. And, you know, it was a damp, dark, cold day. So, honestly, <laughs> I look back and think, how did we survive those few weeks really? But at that point, I had worked in the hospital before. I was a nurse and auxiliary, so it wasn't, I wasn't unfamiliar with people with disabilities. But in those days, there was lots of fear about it, wasn't there? People, you know, everyone you were supposed to meet would have, would have attacked you or wanted to abduct you. There was all sorts of stuff about that, wasn't there? So it was a bit of fear, really, you know. So that was my first recollection of the place when I turned up really from home in a way. I was 18. Um, in those days, I suppose, really, um, it's 40 years ago now, I suppose, we are started as a student nurse and there was no mobile phone in those days, there was no internet. Uh, we were quite poor at home, so we had no home phone, so I couldn't even bring home. Uh, and it was two bus journeys from where we lived to get there. Uh, and there was only one pay phone in the nurse's home and you had to have enough 2Ps and 5Ps to make a call, which nobody ever had any change at all. There was no shop nearby, so you were obsessed by holding on to the change you had. And so you were just really cut off, really. And I used to write a letter to my mum to say when I was coming home. 
And the way I guess you're quite thinking about these these stories is that you'd be writing letters to your mum to say, I'll be home in eight, six to eight weeks, really. I was one of my colleagues and they were uh, feeding a, a young lady and she choked and this staff nurse came in and she just shrieked at us and I just thought, oh, I'm sure I can cover this much more. But I, I'd always wanted to, I think, looking back to be a nurse and I come to it a bit later, but there was something about the job in a way that was so empowering in a way that you were making a difference. And I kept thinking at this point, well, I've committed myself now. I've left one job as a nurse and auxiliary at Westwood Hospital in Bradford to train. So I already made a decision that's what I wanted to do. So I had to just bear down and get on with it really. But looking back, it's why when you asked me earlier about it being mixed emotions, it was very difficult those first few months really. Uh, to picture the place now, it was isolated in the middle of winter, you know, it was. And I didn't drive and they had a little minibus service. They had this strange word for them, they were called brakes. And uh, I think it referred to shooting brakes as they were, but they were yellow minibuses and they were your lifeline, you know, that they would uh, go pick staff up because not many people didn't drive in those days. And they would rely on the bus dropping them off at the mirror at the bottom and then they would get these brakes back and forth. But they also ran shuttles into town. So without that, you would be without provisions really, you know. And we've all got a common bond. Like even with yourself, you know, and whether you come into work. And these people we've all we've all been through the mill in a way, haven't we? We've all experienced those those things, you know, I remember walking onto the ward where and when I qualified I was uh, put on a ward called Blackbird Ward and it was had a terrible reputation and uh, and I didn't mind going there really. I'd actually been on a place on there before. And uh, we were just you didn't have a choice really. I look back and think I was very grateful to be trained as a nurse and I felt like that I paid my duty to society that they paid me. But they also offered me uh, cheap accommodation which meant I could move away from home. So that was partly attraction to make a life for myself and do something different. My own nurses uniforms, you have to wear doctor's uniforms. I remember being ticked off for swinging my stethoscope down the corridor <laughs> by the matron who caught me red handed coming out saying, who do you think you are, Dr. Finley? You might have the name like it, but you're not. You know, like, you know, this is the thing because you were drunk. You ever thought you were a doctor? It was a great thing. It, it well, was a 19 to be walking around the general hospital in Halifax thinking I was a doctor and I'd be an F in my pocket. <laughs> so, you know, so that's just going around. You know, so there was good size to be in a nurse as well, really. But yeah, so that that was a challenge. But the accommodation was a big, a big draw anyway because you were actually on site. But, you know, you looked, literally, I could hear the walls from my bedroom window, you know. And I think. Basically, we all aligned ourselves to the different groups of people. You know that people who are positive and who are, who are not. You generally kept out of the way those that were negative that would just scoff you. And you kind of worked and tried and associated with the people who are more positive, really. Because, you know, in some ways it was exciting, it was change. You know, the hospitals had been there hundreds of years. They, you could see they were dilapidated, the wards were closing. Some people already moved out of the hospital, so you could see they were in a better life. And when you visited people, you know, these homes that they moved into early in Tomodon and Halifax, it was liberating to see that not only were they living a different life, but you could have a completely different career, you know. And in a way, you were free from the shackles of the institution in a way, because as the changes came about, you know, for me, I became more and more empowered. It was liberating, really, you know. It's, it, it'd be very hard to be a nurse and not to be impacted by people that you'd spent quite a lot of time looking after. Because in a way, they became part of like your family. And um, it's quite funny to not, to not get emotional because so much time has passed since that I do get invited to events of theirs or I get invited to the funerals and it's it's incredible to think that they spent so much time of your life together really. Mm. And um, it was quite touching that I went to an event recently and uh, somebody said, um, oh there's all these photographs of the, in this home of you with all the clients, and these amazing photographs. And I said that's because for us it was really important to go away from the hospital and to the homes and show the families that, they, that their sons and daughters sons could have these little amazing lives outside. And for us it was a break as well. I mean, it was hard work in the hospitals, you know. And uh, and some of the people that we looked after, they were amazing and they always stick in your life. And I think for me, because it was classed as a kind of adolescent place when I went to work on the ward, but these people were my age, really. Yeah. And I used to often think, you know, particularly one young lad called Billy was my age exactly, to like two days. And I kept thinking, me and him had such different lives in a way. It was remarkable, but... I felt lucky to have my life, and he was a young man who was my age, and his mum and dad were my age, and uh, so I met them at my age, parents' age. And um, just to make a difference to his life, and because of a similar age to me, you, it's very hard not to make that comparison when yeah. you're younger. I think the big change is maybe I think about people that take uh, not as much shame for families. I think there's a lot of shame for all these families, and I remember them used to be like, ashamed, and they used to say, You have to be ashamed of, you know. And I remember, you know, people were having their children taken off them, you know, and I remember one lady, you know, her son was still, still around and she said to me that 
she was encouraged to put her son in, into, into care. And, the, and we, she got upset about it one day, said, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't, I didn't never wanted to, you know. It had been really poor in what he was touching, the he was going to, to live in, you know. And, and she was just wrapped, she was wrapped with guilt about it all. And then more and more, as if I got to know the families more, because a lot of it was about trust, you know. If you imagine how many years I'd known some of them, you know, that, you know, you become like them, you know, you're ringing up and updating them, and they're seeing you every so often, you know, Christmas, things like that. And they'd set that thing out saying, if I'd have known it, it'd be like this, I wouldn't have never let him come and live in here, you know. I didn't exactly allow him to coach, and because there was a school up there as well, so that often went to the school that was in the hospital grounds up the road, and that's how they ended up being in the hospital. And, and you can see that they were awfully guilt, guilt wrapped, you know. I think that's hopefully the thing that's changed, and that people don't feel ashamed, and that, that there's more acceptance of difference these days. But I've seen the biggest difference is that when I went into this work 40 years ago, everyone thought it was hot. What on earth are you doing that for? And then I look 40 years later, and you know, everyone's doing this sort of work. It's really strange. My name is Julie Robinson, um, I'm a lung disability nurse and I began my nurse training in 1987 and worked at Stansfield View until 1993. Um, so I finished my A-levels, kind of, I'd already decided that I wanted to do nursing and my first memory was getting the bus from Halifax, being told to be picked up by the brake, it's a little mini bus that picks you up at the bottom of the hill. Um, and getting off the bus with my three brand new colleagues because I'd only met them on the Sunday and we started our training as it was then on the Monday um, and driving up the hill in, in, in the minibus and seeing the main hospital because the school of nursing was on at Fielden so the, the smaller site just a little bit further on the road um, and just being I guess kind of the word was a little bit in awe you know but just thinking this is so surreal that a hospital is on top of a hill. And the lady that Pat was talking to was one of the community nurses. It was um, Jenny Littlewood, who, phenomenal lady, phenomenal lady. Um, and we talked about nursing, so I'd always had a passion to do nursing. And kind of, but I'd not really explored different types of nursing, I just assumed a nurse was a nurse in a general hospital, mm. as we were then. Um, and she's like, yeah, he, you know, there's other types of nursing, there's mental health nursing, there's learning disability nursing, although it was mental handicap nurse, we, I'm, I'm an RMH, um, as, as it was defined back in the 80s. And, she, you know, you need to explore these other, these other avenues, another side to life for people with learning disabilities. Well, do you want to come with me? Um, so she visited her, or I think it was every other, every other Sunday there was transport put on, but she didn't drive. Um, to take families to Stansfield View and Pat said, come and see. And if, if, I'm, if I'm brutally honest, that was the most difficult afternoon of my life um, because I had a view of what, what one daughter um, experienced. And yes, there was segregation. She went to a training centre, so a defined service. We had the various groups and all that kind of thing. But to go on to the children's ward, because at that point, point Carrie would have been on, and I, I didn't know how well I'd get to know her, um, would have been on the children's adolescent ward. Uh, and I, it just took my breath away. I was kind of like, really? It's nine, it's all, I'm 1984-ish, is, mm -hmm. is this point. Really, really struck by the different experiences, and the different experience that as a, as a mum, um, Pat was, was, was dealing with that. One daughter at home who she saw every day, one daughter who she saw once a fortnight. Yeah, I, I mean, just reflecting reflecting back on that, walking into a, a, a ward and, and ladies and gents sat rocking with very little stimulation. I'm sure colleagues that were there would say that would be different, but that was my initial perception. And not a homeless smell. Not a clinical smell either, you know, like you walk into an, uh, an aesthetic technique place and it smells very stark, doesn't it? Didn't smell like that at all. And if I'm very frank, I thought, this is not a place where I want to work. This is not what I want to do. But what I did also think were, this is something that I've got to help change. Because this can't be right. This can't be, you've got one section of 
people with learning disabilities have a very different experience and actually the needs of the individuals, going back to me being at the uh, restaurant ATC and I used to go to the special care unit because that's what it's called then, so day service, people with very complex needs, but exactly the same needs, complexity of needs, be it through behaviour or physicality or emotional stuff, as the people that were in the hospital and I was kind of like, how, how can this be? People who've been, people who've been in the hospital since birth and you've got people who'd been in the hospital sort of 5, 10, 15 years. Um, and, and really difficult, and I, I reflected on that when we, when you know, when we move through the, the the journey for people leaving the hospital with those families and, and those choices, and but that drive, that bit, me coming back and having that conversation, not on that day, I was walking to school the day after, um, so Monday morning, Jane was stood at the gate with Pat having a chat as they did, you know, on, on those visits, and she, you know, what did you think? And I was like. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. And actually, I didn't know whether I wanted to do learning disability or mental health nursing at that point. Yeah, you've got poorly fitting pull on curtains, which often didn't pull on. No purpose. And even in the bathrooms, well, not in the bath, not in the physical bathroom, but in the um, in the in the toilets, it's, it's kind of like stable doors. So um, one individual used to sit on the floor in the bathroom. It's on a cold, tiled floor. And my drive for that is, this is not going to be like this in another three or four months because we're going to be in a different environment. Um, but yeah, I found it really difficult, but not as difficult as the individual. And, the, and that whole bit around attitudes. So even thinking about the conversations I'd had, I'm going to go back to Pat, the conversations that I'd had with Pat. Um, and that sense of, well, if I could have cared for Carrie in the community, she'd have been in the community all the time. That, so one of the gentlemen that, that moved with us, he, as I understand it, was born in the hospital. His mum lived in the hospital. I think she arrived pregnant with him. And she'd actually moved, so she was no longer at Stansfield View. She was then at North Arrow. Right. Um, so I think when there'd been some configuration at some point, he and his, his mum his mum were, were separate. They didn't live on the same area of the view, as I understand it. Um, but that that whole environment, so he'd been there for forever. And we've got a real split about... So it was, his, it was the it was only home. home that he'd ever known. And yeah. 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 And that, that freedom, you know, in terms of a large space, as much as I, you know, describe the view as feeling as it did for me, there was space on, in terms of the living areas to move around and we were going to... Remember there being a staff meeting about the move and the, the proposals, and I might be wrong on my timeline on, on, on this one, and in the room was not only staff from the hospital, there was staff from the community teams in the hospital who were objecting to people being able to leave the hospital for exactly the same reasons as I've talked about already, you know, safety and what's going to happen if this happens or the other or, you know, it's not going to be a locked environment, it's people will be safe, will be careful. And I'm just stood there thinking, you support individuals in the community with similar needs. So why is this objection against these individuals having this opportunity to have exactly the same, similar life experiences to everybody else? So that was weird and that was, that was hard and there, and there was um, some resistance about whether it ever happened. Two things, concern and hope had two things because I thought well if the hospital's closing then surely we're moving more towards um, people moving into the community um, and having similar opportunities and experiences as the majority of people in the in Coldfield had at that time. But also a little bit of anxiety, it's like you've got a real opportunity to be involved in people's new start of their new journey, that total bit about community integration and to be beginning there something new and to be thinking that you know these individuals are going to move in into a brand new house, completely different environment to what people were, were, were living in at, at the view at that time. And in terms of the, the physical space and making that personal and nice and good quality, you know, carpets and furnishings, 
absolutely spot on um in terms of robustness um perhaps not so spot on in terms of just thinking through how individuals were going to adapt from being in a a, a, a living environment whereby you couldn't touch the TV at the view to one where you've just got normal domestic type TVs and furnishings and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So high spec, well polished, well delivered in terms of the the actual housing. In terms of the space, that was something we challenged we were challenged with from day one was storage space and um, space for belongings. So a, a in a slightly larger than normal single bedroom, but by the time you've got a wardrobe, someone's wheelchair, a chair for their visitors to sit on, and a bed that was suitable for that individual, a, a little challenging on that. And that challenge of thinking about, okay, so I refer to Carrie again, but what does Carrie's room need to look like? What things does she need to have in it? Even down to like, how do you shop for the day when the individuals are gonna arrive? Because in the hospital, the food just arrived from the from the kitchens, but actually staff were going to have to cook the meals that individuals were going to want, and my staff team didn't know people, um, even on consistency of diet or, and that was particularly challenging. How do you write a shopping list for people that you don't know when actually the kitchen had already always decided that? And with hindsight, I think within that first week, I thought, oh my, I really didn't think this through. I thought through getting the groceries in and, you know, staff going out and doing the shopping and we were unwrapping crockery on the morning when people were moving into the home in the afternoon. You know, it, it was like, it was, it was that tight. The vision was that the, the seven individuals, six of which came from the hospital, would become part of that community in Rastrick. And would be, accepted is not the right word because I didn't have opposition from family, uh, from the neighbours around us um, and I spent a lot of time talking to particularly the neighbours either side of us and the neighbours at the back but it, that was the bit it would be my, my, my aspiration was and it was difficult because Thornhill was on the top of a quite steep hill as you come out of a house which is not the best thing for someone in a wheelchair when you push it but for individuals to be acknowledged by name you know so that like the high carriers you were going down the, the street that was my aspiration. That sounds like a real poor one, but it was to become part of that big house community. So we'd use local facilities, we'd use the local shops. But yeah, one of the main aspirations was to say, right, okay, let's plan some holidays. Let's plan that. So every every resident, and that was the term we used, every 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 one of the individuals that we're supporting here has opportunity to go on a holiday. Every one of the ladies and gents that lived in the home had visits from their family. And we visited, you know, so staff would. And the staff just worked their socks off in, in, in order to get to know people. Um, and I spoke to the staff member and they went, oh, we took her on the, um, a plane. And I literally did do that, on my word. <laughs> we took her on a plane. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on Blackpool Airfield. Yeah, 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 and it was, it was, it was all fun. And the pictures, I, I mean, I just, you know, Really, really good time. Big beaming smile. So they've done the aerial tour around, around, um, around Blackpool. But would Carrie done that at the hospital? I, I, I don't think so. And that did take time for. Well, we'd probably been out in about eighteen months at that point. In terms of the that that personal connectivity, so it, it, there would be times where Carrie would communicate with her behaviours in certain ways. Um, but the first time, uh, her, her mum told me that she used to um, go gilly 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 when, when she was a child and we'd have no speech, we, we got was quite um, expressive, no speech, nothing else. But just to get that sheer enjoyment, because when Carrie was happy, you would get the gilly 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 and the and love of music. Yeah, you know, the staff kept running up the, in, into the house and like, you need to come listen, you know, like it's... Uh, she had very strong bonds with staff and they gave her time, that's what she called time patience. A little bit of firmness, but not firmness in a nasty way, firmness in terms of consistency mm. of message. Our ways of working with individuals is very individual. Just because you approach one individual in one way, that's not a carte blanche to say, oh, we do that in each in each situation. Or it's a, staff learn how to adapt. Any of us, don't you? You get experience out of the people that you're with or the experience that you have and the opportunity 
to live a larger life, I guess. And I think that's what the move out achieved. Um, whether that would have happened at Stansfield View, I don't know. I doubt it. My fondest memory was seeing all the homes open and, and that be that successful transition, but more so for the six individuals that came to live at Thornhill Road. Um, and the change that we saw very, very quickly in those individuals, which is hard to quantify 30 years later. And Jill and that team, so the, the fondness was, I will say, my fondness was seeing Carrie sitting, smiling, listening to her music um, in the middle of the living room, on the floor, with everything around her, compared to what I'd seen when I went to Stansfield View. Shaping from the point of view of that really early conversation, stood at that garden gate, you know, do you really know what this, what you get, what, what, what this nurse, what this lowest policy stuff's about? And that wasn't the term we were using. I think the language and how we, we how we talk are an important part, aren't they? But I think we have a small corner, if that makes sense. So when you talk to wider people outside, working with people with low disabilities or in the wider community, I think, you know, I start to talk to friends and family about my experiences, but how does that ripple through? And I think, finally, there is a recognition of what low disability nursing in particular brings to but brings to the lives of individuals and can enhance services um, and I think that is that's been key that's that's really really been key and having those experiences and having that skill set I think is the, the best opportunity that there is My first memory of Stansfield View is a day I've revisited in my mind countless times. A memory kept alive and present through its significance and importance in my own life. I'm aware I may be an unreliable narrator, and memories change over time. But the images that day conjures remain vivid, within reach. I would have been nervous and probably had little sleep the night before, being careful to be neat and tidy. I caught the bus from the nurses' home where I lived as a student and made the 30-minute journey from Halifax towards Todmorden. Getting off on the roadside and waiting for the brake driver to collect me and anyone else travelling to Stansfield View. Ascending the long winding road through the trees to the hospital. By this time, my nerves were building. I had no idea what to expect. To my eyes, the building was large and imposing. I remember being told to go to an office where I explained why I was there and waited to be met by a charge nurse who took me to Elm Ward, where I was on placement. I can recall long corridors with polished floors and stone stairs, our steps echoing as we walked. A strong smell of detergent, the sound of pots and pans clattering but unseen. My mouth dry as I was very shy and probably said little. The room I was taken to was large and impersonal. I could detect indistinct figures milling around, repeated phrases, an immediate awareness from those that lived there that there was a new presence in their space. A change in the atmosphere as the men of Elm Ward adjusted to my presence and what that might mean to them. The condition of the room seemed quite stark and largely devoid of belongings. A communal area, impersonal, uninviting, stark, impoverished. My next memory of that day is being out walking in the surrounding countryside with three of the men who lived on Elm. The contrast from the closed and restrictive hospital setting to the open countryside and sense of freedom felt liberating, freeing. We walked for miles that day through lanes, across fields and over footpaths, the hospital growing smaller in the distance the sound of birdsong, fresh air and space. One of the men, Greg, I got to know well in the next few years. He became a big influence on me. The way I think about people and how their circumstances can change who they are. Despite everything, Greg never appeared to have given up. He always seemed to me someone who had a strong sense of his own identity and free will. I'm very aware it's unlikely I would have maintained his strength of character if I'd have lived his life. Looking back, I now know 
that bright spring day in 1991 was a time of transition for the people living and working at the hospital. By that time, there were around 50 people with learning disabilities at Stansfield View. In a year or so, the hospital would close its doors forever and those remaining were supported to move into smaller homes in the local communities of Todmorden, Halifax and Brighouse. As a result, there had been little investment in the building. There was a sense of waiting, of biding time. Ted and George were two men I first met at Stansfield View in 1990. I've changed their names as they were unable to consent to sharing their story. I've also altered details so they can't be identified. But what happened to them, for me, highlights that the move from segregated care in the hospital to a more integrated way of living in the community is not as straightforward as we always believe. In some cases, things were lost as well as gained. George moved to Stansfield View in the 1950s when he was a young boy. He appeared to adapt to life at the hospital. He was outgoing, sociable and physically independent. As he spent 40 years of his life there, it's likely he was acclimatised to the routines and way of life, the customs of the institution seeming quite natural to him. He slept in a dormitory style room with another 10 men, shared a bathroom with them, took his meals on the ward where he lived and socialised in a large day room. He would have had few possessions. All he owned would have been stored in a small locker by his bed. Items were often lost or stolen. Clothing would inevitably get mixed up, so people living there would end up wearing each other's things. Because of this, there was little in terms of possessions to express individuality or identity. No real belongings. Ted was younger than George and moved to the hospital in the 1960s. He has a physical disability as well as a learning disability and needs more support than George, only speaking a few words, whereas George is more verbally communicative. By the time I met them both, Stansfield View was in its final stages before closing and so had become quite run down. Several wards had closed as some of the former residents had already moved out of the hospital. George and Ted became friends. Over time, this developed into a physical intimacy. This was known by those who worked at the hospital, and although not openly condoned, it was not entirely discouraged. The size of Stansfield View enabled people who lived there to spend time alone away from the supervision of staff or the interference of the other residents. It's likely that Ted and George would have been able to pursue their relationship in relative privacy if they chose to. In 1993, when Stansfield View closed and the remaining residents moved out into smaller homes in their local communities, it was only natural that Ted and George would remain together. They moved to a home with five other men on a quiet street not far from town. For the first time in their lives, they had their own rooms. The relationship continued and in the smaller environment, as they grew older, George was able to help Ted due to his physical disabilities, often leading him by the hand, passing him his drink, offering him reassurance when he needed it, and other ways he was able to demonstrate that he cared about him. The relationship continued, and it was acknowledged that provided they were both in agreement to spend time alone together and use the privacy of their own rooms, there was no reason they should not continue to have an intimate and what appeared loving relationship. This went on for many years as they adapted to their new life. Until one day, a member of staff who had not worked in the home before entered one of their rooms without knocking to put some of their laundry away and then discovered them in bed together. The staff member who was unaware of their relationship made a safeguarding alert. After an investigation, a decision was made that due to their learning disabilities, Ted and George were assessed as lacking capacity to make an informed decision to have an intimate relationship. A decision was made they should no longer spend time alone together. Hello, my name is David Harling and I'm the National Deputy Director for Learning Disability Nursing based in the Chief Nursing Officers team at NHS England. 
1919, there was the original introduction of the Nurses' Registration Act that saw learning disability nursing become recognised as a dedicated field of practice. Um, the training for learning disability nurses back then was provided by an organisation called the Royal Medico Psychological Association, primarily an organisation for medical colleagues, particularly psychiatrists. But the evolution of learning disability nursing has seen a great many changes uh, and the language of the qualification itself has changed. At the outset of the profession, our qualification in learning disability uh, was referred to as mental deficiency. So the first registrants um, were known as mental deficiency nurses. Um, we then moved forward some decades later to become um, referred to and registered as uh, nurses for the mentally subnormal or mental subnormality. And in the 70s and 80s, again, with societal changes and different thinking around new models of care, it was moved towards registered nurses um, for the mentally handicapped. And then we come right forward to the modern day where the qualification is known as a registered nurse for people with a learning disability. So the changes themselves in the language of the qualification are concurrent to the changes that we've seen in the design and the delivery and the thinking that underpins the different services in which people with learning disabilities uh, access or in part have, have lived within. In terms of the evolution of learning disability nursing within um, and the relationship within institutions, it changed considerably within the period um, of the, the early 70s right through to the early 2000s. And I think that was such an important time, not only for the profession, but importantly for the people we cared for. The relationship prior to that was one of being attendant to individuals who stayed within those places, who had to live within those institutions, and therefore caring for them was the primary focus, alongside ensuring to a degree their safety and that they were fed and watered. It was very, in, in many ways, very primitive. Um, as, as we started to work uh, both in terms of policy and practice, within that period of change from 1970s onwards through community care and the advent of valuing people and other, and other policy and strategy, that focus and that shift on empowering people to have much more choice and a, and a greater say in the, the care that they received was absolutely critical. I don't think this is a clear cut either or in terms of the role and the function and, and in fact the purpose of, of nursing within what was known as long stay hospitals. To a degree, we might say they were part of the problem as well as the solution, but that's informed by and would have been informed by at the time societal views and, and kind of the best model of care for people. And whilst we now challenge some of that and we dispel the idea of large congregate settings, we are often quick to forget that a great many people did leave those establishments and went on to reintegrate back into their local communities. I think another important consideration in the whole idea of the relationship between learning disability nurses um, and whether or not they were part of the problem or the solution has to be related to the thinking of the time and, and the model of care, if you like, in which people were being provided for, namely in large institutions. And that was informed by post-industrialisation thinking of whether or not people were in fact productive or could be productive members of society. The Mental Deficiency Act in how it classified people into different grades and ideas about who they were and what they were capable of. And, and, and of course, the eugenics movement that very powerfully informed or sought to inform people of a view that individuals with learning disabilities particularly uh, were not and would never be equal members of society. Oh, 
You got the hand back. Oh, God. Ooh, it's big thing in back. Oh, I this. What's this? He looked at the kid in the mouth and, oh, where am I been? Yeah, the long, long, my long, my brain. Yeah, no, my, 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 I got that. It's a fat, it's a good one, A group of us visited the Nothing About Us Without Us exhibition at the People's History Museum in Manchester. 30 years on from the closure of Stansfield View, the exhibition celebrates disability activism and the role of people with learning disabilities and others in improving equality and inclusion for all. Helping change values and attitudes and to create a fairer society where people with learning disabilities have opportunities that during the time of Stansfield View would have been unimaginable. I spoke to Sarah, who is supported by St Anne's Community Services, the organisation that supported people with learning disabilities to move into homes in the community when Stansfield View closed in 1993. Um, I think that Back then, times were really different. I think that people weren't treated equally. I think they were looked down upon. Um, and I think at times, we can still have that mindset of institutionalising people with disabilities, whether it's in hospital or in care rooms or in residential homes. I think we put people in a box and we... Um, we just forget them and we just think right we've got these people over here let's just exclude them from society mm. and I think that um, back then it was obviously much worse because people had hit we forget that people have hidden disabilities don't they mm. some people don't look disabled it doesn't mean that they're not mm. and so I think in today's society we can still have that mindset of if you don't look a certain way, if you look a certain way, you fit this category, that category, instead of saying people have individuality and they've got separate needs, we need to treat people equally. It's hard for me to separate my life from my career. Difficult to imagine my personal life without my professional life. Many of the people with learning disabilities I've supported have become friends who continue to be an important part of my life. People who have influenced me, affected me, inspired me, moved me. People I care about, people I'm all the better for having known. Having a learning disability does not diminish someone's capacity to feel, to love, to connect, to enhance and bring meaning to the lives of others, to contribute, to be valued, to belong. Things that would have been difficult to achieve for those living at Stansfield View. But it's all too easy to take a reductive view. The past is all bad as we move towards an ever brighter future. In reality, the story of people with learning disabilities is more complex than that. More nuanced. Ultimately, there are as many stories of Stansfield View as there are lives lived there. There is a danger of othering the experience of people separated by time and circumstances. People who were literally and figuratively removed from the world, separated. But it's also true that at Stansfield View and other long stay hospitals for people with learning disabilities, a culture was created and a sense of identity. This film is a love letter to all the people I've been fortunate enough to have known with learning disabilities and the many colleagues and friends associated with Stansfield View. In the years since its closure, our attitudes to difference have changed. We can now celebrate what sets us apart and take pride in that, as well as what brings us together. This film is intended as a memorial, not just to a past, but an acknowledgement of the present and a look towards a future we can all contribute to. One of understanding, value and opportunity. 
a celebration of the countless lives, of the endurance, courage and fortitude of those who lived at Stansfield View. <laughs>